Here's my first question. When it comes to praying late or early, not praying on time, when it comes to not praying on time, without an excuse, not praying on time without an excuse, what's worse, praying early or praying late? I think that's an easy one. 10, 9, 8, praying early, correct. Why is praying early worse than praying late? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, because the prayer time is not in because it's not acceptable before the time is due. Okay, that's correct answer. Because the prayer time is not in, so it's not valid, because it's not acceptable before the time is due. Correct, meaning the time didn't even come in yet. In the case of praying late, at least the time came in, so the prayer can be valid. So both of them are major sins, Praying early without an excuse, praying late without an excuse, and praying early without an excuse is worse because the time didn't even come in so to make the prayer valid in the first place. Praying late is not as bad because at least the time is in, that time that validates the prayer, and now you're making it up. It's a makeup prayer. All right. Good job. Next question. Give me three reasons, not one reason at a time, three reasons all together, three excuses for praying early or late. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four, travel, sickness, and rain. Correct answer. Travel, sickness, and rain. Correct. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Ibn Mubarak, can you please explain um, the the sickness and the rain one, please? Sure. For praying early or late. Yes. When it comes to the rain, it is permissible to pray Asr prayer at Dhuhr time and Isha prayer at Maghrib time. So it's permissible to advance the later prayer to the time of the earlier prayer. And it is not permissible to delay the time of the earlier prayer to the time of the later prayer. Nor is it permissible to shorten the prayer for the rain. So for the rain prayer, you can just bring forward the later prayer and pray both of those prayers for rakahs. As long as all the conditions are met. Among them is that it is a heavy rain that soaks the clothing. And among them is that that the prayer is prayed in congregation in a place of congregation. So it's not valid to do that in your own house. Even if you pray in congregation with your family, because your house is not a place of congregation, of jama'ah. Being a place of congregation means that the Muslims know that they can go there if they want to participate in the congregational prayer. So the masjid or the musalla. And it's a condition that it would be raining when you start the first prayer. So it's raining heavily. When you say Allahu Akbar with the intention to pray Dhuhr, you pray your full four cycles. And it's a condition that it's raining when you finish and then stand up to say the takbir for the next prayer. You have the intention during Dhuhr prayer to bring the Asr prayer forward. Then you'll pray your Asr prayer for Raka'ahs. 
There's also a few other details there that inshallah ta'ala, maybe we'll go over them someday. Or you'll get them from someone else. That's for the rain. As for the sickness, they differed about whether this is an excuse or not. So some scholars did not consider sickness an excuse in the first place. So they said there's only two, traveling and rain. In the case of sickness, it was said that if the sickness is so strong that it's the type of sickness that would enable you to make tayammum, you wouldn't be obligated to use the water because of the intensity of your sickness. Or, as I have learned, a sickness that is so strong that there's nothing you can do but think of the pain. You can't fear Allah because you are so preoccupied with pain. In this case, there's three possibilities. Either you believe that your sickness will get worse, or you believe that it will get lighter, or you believe that it will stay constant. So according to this saying, if you believe that the sickness will get worse, then it is permissible for you to advance the later prayer to the time of the earlier one so that you can catch them or pray them both at a time when the sickness is lighter. If you believe that the sickness will get lighter and that it's worse now, then it's permissible for you to delay the earlier prayer to the time of the later prayer so that you can pray both of them at a time where the sickness is easier. And if you believe that the sickness will stay constant, then you have to just pray all of your prayers on time with no adjustment. According to a shafii how do you make up the prayers that you missed without an excuse? How do you make up the prayers that you missed without an excuse? I'll give you 15 seconds for that. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. You said immediately. Okay. That's true. That's a correct answer. According to Ashafi'i, you have to pray them immediately. All right. So let me refine my question then. What if a person had years of prayers that they need to make up? How would he do that? 10, 9, Eight, seven, six. Then one has to devote all his free time to pray the missed prayers. You have to pray in all extra time. Correct. So according to Ashafi'i, a person who has lots of prayers to make up, his big number of prayers does not permit him to delay those prayers further. Because once they came in, they were due, and it was never permissible to delay them in the first place. Subhanallah. That's the answer I give people when they ask me about this question. I don't give them the something that other people say about praying so many prayers after every obligatory prayer. Even to make them make it easier for them. Allah, you know, Allah knows about that saying. Allahu Allah. The prayer time came in. It's already due. It was never even permissible for you to delay the prayer in the first place. So how did it become permissible? After it was haram to delay the prayer in the first place, how did it become all of a sudden permissible to delay it? MashaAllah can. So according to this, you only sleep the time that you need so that you can stand and pray, that might be six hours, maybe seven hours. Seven should be good, usually. You only eat the amount that you need so that you can stand and pray. That means you don't get seconds, a second helping. Because now you're using time that should be used for prayer to do something you don't need to do. And you can run your errands, do whatever it is you need to do to maintain yourself. 
And besides all of that, you need to pray. That's it. So then, according to that, you don't watch movies. You don't do anything like that. You don't pray soon the prayers. You don't sit and make dhikr. If you have another obligation that you need to do, it's permissible for you to do your errands. So if there's a, some task, some obligation, something you need to do, then you can do it. But all your free time needs to go to making up the prayers that you missed without an excuse. You say, what about lessons? So that's, that is included in my answer. If it's an obligation, then he's allowed to do his tasks, to do his errands. If it's not an obligation, like a lesson he's learned already, or something that's not personal obligatory knowledge, then he needs to make up his prayers. What is a manier, a prohibitive matter, something that prohibits a person from prayer? What is that? Or give me examples. Can you give me two or three examples of manier? A prohibitive matter, something that disables a person from praying. Ten, nine, eight. I'm looking for three. Seven, six, five, four, three. Menstruation, lack of mental discrimination. Okay. Nifas, okay. That's technically three. Menstruation, lack of mental discrimination, yani insanity. Nifas, that's different from menstruation. So technically that's three. MashaAllah. As for incontinence of urine, this does not prevent the person from praying. Um, fainting, yes, that's the one I was looking for. That's close to mental dis lack of mental discrimination. So menstruation actually disables a person from praying. The woman cannot pray while menstruating. Insanity disables the person from praying. Fainting disables a person from praying. Not sleeping. Fainting is not the same as sleeping. Postpartum bleeding also disables a woman from praying. So, correct. That's correct answer. MashaAllah. So, that's called manier, something that actually just stops you from praying. It, it stops you. It blocks you from praying, prevents you from praying. What is a perpetual impurity? Dawamul hadath. Perpetual or ongoing or lasting impurity. I'll give you 15 seconds for that. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Incontinence of urine. You said incontinence of urine or sickness bleeding? Uh-huh. Like it's the halal that does not stop. So according to that answer, if a woman had... It's the halba, sickness bleeding. Or a man, his urine dripped. That by itself is enough to say that this person has a perpetual impurity? At what point does it become perpetual? How long does it have to last? It becomes perpetual when by the time you make it, by the time you make it and then it's time for you to even pray, it's going to come back, whether it's, whether it's urine or whether it's, um, whether it's bleeding. By the time you make the do. And sometimes even by the time you finish you do or by the time you have to go pray, it's going to come back. That's what makes it professional. Correct. Correct answer. Or if you want, you can say it this way. Um, you are not able to perform purification and prayer before it comes back. Or that it comes so frequently, the leakage is so frequent that you cannot complete a purification and prayer without it coming back so once that vaginal bleeding that's not menses is doing that or the urine or the gas or anything else is like that such leakage it becomes daim 
ongoing when it reaches that frequency that we just mentioned. All right. Good. MashaAllah. So, this person who has this problem, since the urine doesn't stop and the blood doesn't stop, are they allowed to just not pray until it goes away? Like, is this person... No, they must pray. Yeah, the person has to pray. So, this person has to pray, and we have learned that this person has special rules that they need to follow for purification. We don't even have to go through those special rules right now. We have plenty of questions. So, whoever needs that can ask about it, inshallah ta'ala. How about we ask some questions about the guardians, the awliya. That's one of the meanings of the word wali. Has many, many, many meanings. Wali can be a guardian. A wali can be an ally. A wali can be a pious saint. A wali can be an heir, someone who inherits from you. So my first question is, when is the guardian obligated to command the child to pray? At what point is the guardian obligated to command the child to pray? Fifteen. You said when it reaches mental discrimination. Yes, what's your answer? Go ahead. Um, is it when they become seven lunar years? Um, all right. So you said, is it when the child becomes seven lunar years? Murad said, when the child reaches mental discrimination... Uh, Sister Fatuma said, when the child becomes mumayiz, which is mental discrimination, all of your answers are lacking. There's something missing from every answer that was just given so far. So we want another chance. I'll give you 10 more seconds. When is the guardian obligated to command the child to pray? 10, 9, Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. If the child does not start praying by itself, no. One. Ah. Okay. The guardian is obligated to command the child to pray. When the child reaches mental discrimination and is seven lunar years. I got two different answers from you. Each one of you, your answer was half of the answer. If we put both of them together, we get the correct answer. Not just when the child reaches seven lunar years. Not just when the child has mental discrimination. If the child has mental discrimination at seven lunar years, then it's an obligation. Then it's an obligation on the guardian to command the child to pray. So if the child reaches mental discrimination before seven, it's not obligatory on the guardian to command the child to pray. If the child reaches seven before mental discrimination, it's not even permissible for the guardian to command the child to pray because he can't pray yet. In the other case, he can tell the child to pray, but he's not obligated to if the child is not seven lunar years yet. MashaAllah. Is that two for me? I think so. One and a half? Oh, MashaAllah. Is that because you, you all gave me half of the answer for the last question? Okay. Next question. What is the judgment of the one who leaves out the prayer out of laziness. He doesn't pray because he's negligent. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 
He's sinful. Um, He's Muslim, but major sinner. Enormous sin. Sinful. Yes, what's your answer? That was my answer. She's just major, um, major sinner. So that's the correct answer. If a Muslim does not perform the obligatory prayer out of negligence and laziness, not out of disbelieving in it and denying it, then he's a major sinner. He's a Muslim who is a major sinner. He's not a kafir. Some scholars said he's a kafir, and that's not correct. The correct saying is that he's a major sinner. Next question. How about we find a question or two in the invalidators of wudu? If a person touched with his skin the nail of a marriageable woman, would that break his wudu? No, it would not. How about her hair? No, it would not. How about her teeth? No, it would not. How about her eyeball? Her eyeball itself. Yes, it would. It would break his wudu because that's like flesh. Correct. How about her gums? If he touched her gums, would it break his wudu? Yes, it would. So if he touched her nail or her teeth or her hair and that doesn't break his wudu, does that mean that that's permissible? Is he allowed to do that with a marriageable woman? No, he's not allowed to do that. Question from Istinja. Is a person allowed to make Istinja by wiping if he has access to water? Yes, he is. Well, Sister Fatuma, you said it depends. Why you said that? If the urine did not spread or dry. Okay. So that's fine. We can say, yes, a person is allowed to make Istinja by wiping even if he has access to water. With the condition that the najasa that came out is has not dried already, and with the condition that it hasn't spread beyond the limit that it's allowed to be inside of, that's true, and also a few other conditions. Here's a question for you. What is istibra? Istibra. I'll give you 15 seconds for that. What is istibra? 14, 13, 12, 11. Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's to make sure that you don't have anything still in there. Like, so, like, you cough to make it come out. Like, when you're urinating. Uh huh. Yeah, so, like, you would cough to make you come out or push down to make her come out and then you proceed to make the urine and to make the extender. Okay, now I don't know that istibra is done by coughing. I haven't learned that. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking for something else. You, you press the, you, you apply pressure to the area to get the excess Urine out. Okay. You wait for a time and you apply pressure. Which area? Do you know the word, the English word? The urethra. The urethra. Right? Yes, correct. All right, so it means to push on the urethra, which is basically the tube um, in which the urine flows when the person, when a man urinates, or even if he ejaculates. So that tube, which runs on the underside of the penis, for him to uh, push on that tube, to push out any remaining urine, that's called istibra. Is that obligatory? Is istibra obligatory? Only if one knows that uh, one would contaminate oneself if you didn't do it. Correct. Istibra is obligatory for the one who knows that if he doesn't do it, he will contaminate himself. Otherwise, it's sunnah, not obligatory. Next question about ghusl. Question, how many things make the ghusl obligatory? Ten. Okay, Brother Murad says five. Mufayyid says five. 
Anyone else have any different answer other than five? Hodge Kevin says six. Correct answer. Both of those are correct answers. Five or six? MashaAllah. Which one is the one that they... Okay, you said if you count the washing of the dead, then it's six. Correct. I didn't even get the chance to get the question out, subhanAllah. All right, so five things make ghusl obligatory. And if you want to count the ghusl that you give to the dead person, that's six. That death is the sixth one. But those who don't count that, why do they not count it? We obviously know that we have to give a ghusl to the dead person. So why wouldn't it be counted here? Fifteen. Fourteen. Thirteen. 12, 11, because the dead can't perform it themselves, because the dead is not accountable for it, because it is not an obligation, a personal obligation on the dead person. Correct. Those who don't count the ghusl of the dead person, or those who don't count death as a reason for ghusl to be obligatory, didn't count it there because they said that we're talking about when a person is obligated to perform a ghusl for himself. We're not talking about when you're obligated to wash someone else. And then they talked about giving the ghusl to the dead person in the chapter of funeral prayer. Is a person obligated to perform a ghusl for the pre-ejaculation that comes out by arousal, which is the sticky fluid for the man and the wetness for the woman? Sister Jamila said no. Um Fayed said no. Correct answer. It is not obligatory to perform a ghusl from that stuff. Rather, you would only have to make istinja and wudu. If a person woke up and he thinks back to his night while he was sleeping and he says, Wallahi, I felt the ejaculation in my sleep. I had a wet dream. Then he looks and doesn't see anything at all. Nothing. When he thinks about that, when he thinks back and recalls, he's, he says, I know I felt it while I was asleep, but then when he looks, he doesn't see anything at all whatsoever. Is this person obligated to perform a ghusl? Brother Murad said yes. A few other people said no. The correct answer is yes. Yes, he is obligated because he's sure, that's why, that he felt the ejaculation. He's not doubtful about it. He says, I know I felt it, but when I look, I don't see anything then he's obligated to perform a ghusl. Because ejaculation has how many signs, brothers and sisters? Three signs, okay. Which are, what are those signs? It exits in spurts. Or in other words, it pumps out. Or in other words, one has convulsions when it comes out or muscle spasms. That's one. Ten. It smells like egg white when dry and smells like dough when wet. Correct. It exits with pleasure. Correct. Those are the three. It exits with pleasure, it comes out in spurts, and it has a certain smell. Correct. So those are the signs of many. If a person is positive that he experienced any of that, then he has to perform a ghusl even if he doesn't see it. Is it obligatory to perform a ghusl for kissing? No. No. Or how about 
like just touching or fondling or anything like that, is it obligatory to perform ghusl? No. No, it is not. If a woman delivered a baby without any bleeding, just the baby came out and there was no blood, not a drop of blood, would she be obligated to perform a ghusl? Yes, she would. When a person performs a ghusl, is he allowed to just wipe over his beard like when he makes wudu? No, he's not. Is the, is the person obligated to undo the his hair, like to take he or, he, he or she, take out the braids, to take out the, the matting, like the dreadlocks, to pull it apart? Is that a condition for the ghusl to be valid? If the water reaches all the hair, no. Correct. Okay. Okay, question. What do you call the religious impurity? That religious impurity that we want to remove by performing wudu or ghusl. Hadath. Correct. Hadath. Which act lifts... The big hadath, or the greater hadath, the ghusl, which act lifts the small hadath, the minor hadath? Everybody saying wudu. Anything else? Wudu and ghusl. And the ghusl, correct. And the ghusl also lifts the small hadith. The wudu and the ghusl. As long as you don't do anything while performing your obligatory ghusl, not sunnah ghusl. As long as you don't do anything while performing the obligatory ghusl that would invalidate a wudu, such as touching the private part or urinating or touching the skin of your spouse, for example, then that ghusl will lift the small hadith even if you don't make wudu. But making wudu is sunnah. I think we can stop here. Any question before we go?